every Comanche burned to avenge the council house outrage. Vengeful warriors conjured the greatest raid in their history, one that would strike deep into the areas of Texian settlement and show their range and dominance. Yet such an incursion required time to plan and organize, a venture made more difficult by the loss of prominent chiefs in San Antonio. By August 1840, the Pinateca had settled on Buffalo Hump to lead the foray. Phallic connotations infused his Numana name. Pocha Naquarim, that most puritanical whites refused to decipher. The most accurate translation is erection that will not go down. He summoned other Comanche bands. By August, between 400 and 500 warriors had gathered and were preparing to hurl a punitive attack south of Gonzales and eastward along the Guadalupe Valley. Since their women and children accompanied them, the band may have totaled 1,000 souls. That number included several Kiowa allies and Mexican agents who functioned as guides. By August 6th, the throng approached Victoria on the Guadalupe River's eastern bank. At first, citizens mistook the raiders for Lipan Apaches, a friendly tribe with whom they often traded. The warriors' violent actions soon corrected that impression. Resident John J. Lynn recalled, we of Victoria were startled by the apparitions presented by the sudden appearance of 600 mounted Comanches in the immediate outskirts of the village. Galloping through town, Comanches killed 15 citizens and captured a herd numbering about 1,500 horses. Texians retreated into strongholds and fended off the assault, and Buffalo Hump's band flowed like the Guadalupe toward the coast. The windfall of captured horses pleased warriors, but limited their mobility. Instead of riding hard and fast, the horde now moved at the sluggish pace of a white man's cattle drive. Linville, established by John J. Lynn in 1831, was the Texas Republic's second busiest port. Settler George W. Bunnell described it as an anchorage where a great many goods have been received. It is finally situated for the commerce of the upcountry and will no doubt be a place of considerable importance. In 1840, Lynn recorded 130 town lots for taxation. The settlement boasted 200 residents and 11 slaves. So it was no accident that the Mexican guides led Buffalo Hump's force toward the seaside village. Its destruction would cripple Texian fortunes, offer a rich source of plunder, and gratify both Comanche and Mexican ambitions. On August 8th, the Comanche struck Linville like God's own hammer. They cut down three residents to start the terror. Customs official Hugh Oren Watts refused to leave until he retrieved a gold watch from his house. He tarried too long. Warriors overtook and killed him. Then they captured his new bride, a slave woman, and her child. Citizens took refuge on the water. Rowing out in small skiffs, they boarded Captain William G. Marshall's schooner that lay anchored in the bay. Now beyond the range of Comanche arrows and lances, 
Linville residents remained close enough to witness the wanton destruction of their homes. One fuming bureaucrat could not bear the sight. Sitting offshore in a rowboat, Judge John Hayes decided that he would not sit by while barbarians ravaged his town. Shotgun in hand, he waded onto shore, cursing Comanches to perdition. His behavior mystified the warriors. Believing Hayes insane, they rode near, but dared not harm him, lest his bad medicine might contaminate them. At length, the crestfallen official returned to his boat and rowed away from the beach. Only then did the magistrate examine his weapon. He had forgotten to load it. That day, Linville warehouses bulged with trade goods. Reports placed the value of the merchandise as high as $3,000. Among the ordinary trade items were crates of hats and umbrellas bound for Bayer merchant James Robinson, ornamental objects which delighted the raiders. Lynn recalled, these the Indians made free with and went dashing about the blazing village amid their screeching squaws and their little engines like demons in a drunken Saturnalia with Robinson's hats on their head and Robinson's umbrellas bobbing about on every side like tipsy young balloons. Without opposition, marauders took their time. They spent the rest of the day plundering and burning. Wanting to leave nothing the Texians could use, the warriors drove cattle into pens and slaughtered them. Adorned with top hats and umbrellas, Numana tied calico bolts to their horses' tails and trailed them through the streets. Buffalo Hump left the smoldering town site late that afternoon satisfied. Not a single building or item of value remained. His warriors literally wiped Linville off the map. The Comanches were exultant. Each brave boasted ponies and plunder, which brought status and honors. Yet their loot slowed them to a crawl diminishing the mobility that had once made them perilous. Did Buffalo Hump perceive the danger? Probably, but even a chief of his renown would not ask a warrior to part with his booty. Its acquisition had been the entire object of the raid. Worse still, the raiders had lost the advantage of surprise. News of their great foray spread across central Texas. Rangers mustered and mounted up. Militiamen, regulars, and Tonkawa allies met and marched. General Felix Huston calculated the Comanche's route back to their hill country and Rolling Plains camps and called for Texian fighting men to assemble on the banks of Plum Creek near Lockhart. There, he hoped, he might offer Buffalo Hump a surprise of his own. 